Well, let me begin just by saying uh, how great it is to have our kiddos in here with us this morning. I love having um, our, our children in the service with us. And, and hear me say this, kids. Um, you are a part of this church. Um, whether you're, you're five years old or ten years old or in middle school, whatever it is, understand that, that you are a part of this church, a vital part. And we're so glad that you are here with us this morning. In fact, we've got these little children's bulletins. If you may have grabbed one of these. And um, it's a little bit ominous because the first question on the top says, what things do you do when you're bored? Um, there's not high hopes for the sermon this morning, I don't think. But um, on that note uh, of being bored, I, I noticed recently my family was traveling back from... Um, South Carolina, and uh, we, we have made that trip, I've made that trip since I was a child. Um, we have vacationed down there for years. My in-laws, 20 of us, went down and went down to Hilton Head Island, and, and I just noticed how different the experience of that road trip is for my kids than it was for me. Um, because throughout the whole entire 15-hour drive, they all had various forms of technology that was available to them to distract them throughout the time. So they're some of them are streaming something on Netflix, others are playing a game, we even have one of those little screens in our van you can put down and watch a movie and all this different stuff. And I remember one of my kids like setting down some piece of technology and just going, ah, oh, I'm bored. <laughs> I was like, what? Like, you have no idea what it means to be bored. Like, I, it, the way we passed the time when we were doing that trip is we played a game where we tried to find the letters of the alphabet. <laughs> like, you would look at billboards and, and license plates and see who could make it through. Like, finding letters was our idea of, of entertainment on a road trip. And they're like, ah, oh, this season's over of whatever. I got to <laughs> find something else to do. And it's interesting because all of this technology that is available to us nowadays, there's, there's a part of it that the expectation that comes with it is, is something of expediency, of the immediate, right? That, that, that this is going to um, enable things to happen more quickly. And we live in that climate all the time. We have fast food and microwaves and high-speed internet, and so we expect results and we expect them to come quickly. But the side effect of all of that is I think we as a people, and this is, applies to us as adults as well, we've become increasingly less patient. It becomes increasingly more difficult for us to wait for something. Like if you ever order something, if you have Amazon Prime, it's there in two days. If you ever order something that's not on Amazon, and it says five to seven days, you're like, what? Come on, like I, five to seven days, who waits that long, right? Like that, that's the world that we live in now. Of course, this same sort of philosophy, understanding of life can, can creep into our spiritual lives as well. We, we want to see spiritual growth and, and we want to see it happen instantaneously. All, all of our struggles with sin, we want those to, to be removed and any sort of difficulty or discomfort um, should be gone in the blink of an eye. And, and sometimes without the sort of spiritual discipline and the committed faithfulness that is, that is oftentimes necessary as the Holy Spirit is unfolding those things in us, we, we want results and we, we want it now. This summer, we have been studying the book of James together. And now we're coming to the end of this letter. And as this letter wraps up, James is going to return to some of the same themes that he spoke about when he first began. Primarily how followers of Jesus should respond in the midst of suffering. So if you recall all the way back to, to early June when we were studying chapter 1, remember James said, he writes this to the church and he says, Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, because we know that that develops perseverance, and perseverance is necessary in our lives if we're going to become mature and complete. Later in that same chapter, in, in verse 12, James writes, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trials. Having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love them. Because this is their reality, this is the world that they live in, James, as he's concluding this letter, he, he returns 
into their suffering and once again he wants to speak into this and and how they're to respond and this is where we pick things up in james chapter 5 this is james 5 i'm going to read through through verse 12 uh, beginning in verse 7. he says be patient then brothers and sisters until the lord's coming see how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rain you too be patient and stand firm because the lord's coming is near don't grumble against one another's brothers and sisters or you will be judged the judge is standing at the door brothers and sisters as an example of patience in the face of suffering take the prophets who spoke in the name of the lord as you know we count as blessed those who have persevered and you've heard of job's perseverance and have seen what the lord finally brought about the lord is full of compassion and mercy above all my brothers and sisters do not swear by heaven or by earth or by anything else all you need to say is a simple yes or no otherwise you will be condemned james writes throughout this summer james james has been focused on concentrating on teaching the church that that as a follower of jesus we should act out or live out our faith in Jesus. In fact, James's question, if, if that's not happening, I'm, I'm wondering if that faith is sincere, if it's real. James now in these verses is, is going to demonstrate once again how the follower of Jesus is enabled or, or called to live in, in the midst of suffering. And he begins this by saying, church, be patient. Be patient. This is the first thing that, that James wants us to understand as the church as it relates to living in the midst of suffering. James uses that simple refrain four times throughout those verses. It, it, it is simple and yet at the same time incredibly difficult to, to be patient, to wait. I don't know if you know this or not, but there's, there's actually a study of waiting it's actually the science of queuing, they call it. And one of the real experts in this field, uh, may come as no surprise to you, is Disney. Because if you've ever gone to Disney, how many of you kids have ever been to Disney? Anybody here? Yeah, me too. I got to go like a couple years ago. It was awesome. And, and when we were there, there's constantly lines. That's part of, of the experience. But Disney has studied how to enable that experience to be as positive as possible. And so they do things like they, they create single file lines. So because in a single file line, we feel a justice about who gets to go next. But when you have multiple lines, and if, has this ever happened to you at like the airport or whatever, or the grocery store? Do not get in the line I am in. I promise you, that will be the slowest one. <laughs> you, you stand in line, you see somebody get in line behind you, and all of a sudden they're ahead of you. What are you thinking? Like, this world is unjust, you know, like you... <laughs> This can't be happening. What have I done? All this. So, so Disney eliminates that. And they never show you the entire line, especially in any of the newer rides. You get in there and you weave through and then you kind of go to this room that's back there and you weave through a line there and then there's a third space. You never see it all in one collective time. And then there's, there's little experiences for you along the way to kind of entertain you and keep your mind focused and help distract you while you wait. But what is key in, in all of it, and, and most important, is that at the end of it, the experience is worth it. That what they deliver on is, is so entertaining, so valuable. You see such an incredible smile on your kid's face that you say, that was, that was worth it. I uh, uh, recently, I told you I was in Hilton Head vacationing with my family, and we went to this seafood restaurant, like a hole-in-the-wall place. That, and, we got there just as it was opening for dinner and there was an hour long wait outside and we stood in that line and i had the most delicious blackened scallops you will ever eat in your life and you know what i said when it was all said and done i never said anything about the hour wait i, I never for a moment thought about how long that took i thought that was delicious that that was worth it the church that James is writing to 
in the midst of their their circumstances has been forced out of jerusalem they've been scattered throughout the region and because of the intensity of this persecution that they've experienced james is is riding in the midst of their suffering and he says church be be patient and i i'm just wondering how i would have received that if if i was hearing this for the very first time james if i'm opening this letter and i'm reading this and i've left everything that i own i've left my home and and i'm running for my life because of the threat that's against me and james writes and he says be patient okay my knee-jerk reaction is that i feel like i would have been looking for something more but i think what we discover here in james in james instruction to the church really is that something more because this what james is telling them here this is not just this passive um, um, sit back and and endure let things be james is actually instructing them to to actively express their faith by placing their trust in jesus to handle their situation so this instruction to be to be patient this is an action let me see that again he, he he's saying to be patient means to to actively place your faith in jesus and trust him to handle your situation it's an act it's an act of the will and it's an incredibly difficult one at times see the key to this act of the will however is is the reality that this injustice that this that this oppression that this victimization all this evil that they've experienced that this doesn't have the last word because james james helps them understand why they can be patient look again at verse 7 james writes here he says be patient brothers and sisters until the lord's coming look in verse 8 james writes this he says be patient and stand firm because the lord's coming is near again now look at verse 9 at the very end of this verse james writes and says the judge is standing at the door See, the call, the call to be patient in the life of the Christian is rooted in the expected return of Jesus. The Christian lives in this tension of the already and, and the not yet. Jesus has come and he's brought in his kingdom, he's ushered it in, and he's invited us to participate in that, to live in that, and to experience it. And yet it will find its completion when Jesus returns again. And so the, the Christian is living in the midst of, of that tension and and so we live in a world of waiting this is what jesus writes or says about himself in luke chapter 4. this is what the church is waiting for it's both come and we wait for it this is verse 16 he says he went to nazareth where he had been brought up and on the sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom he stood up to read in the scroll uh, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me and proclaim, to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearings. Jesus is ushered in the kingdom of God, and he's proclaiming the good news that you and I are invited into that. And, and he has created the church. He's built the church to continue that mission, not only where we're living in that kingdom, and we're experiencing that together, and we're growing in that. We're not perfect in that, but but we're intended to make progress in that and we're intended to invite other people into it and yet the kingdom of this world remains and it remains in opposition to this kingdom of god and so james is telling us while this is already happened the fulfillment of it will come when jesus returns and in the meantime there is pain and suffering and injustice and prejudice and and oppression and so james writes and says be patient be patient church actively place your faith in jesus to handle 
your situation because he's going to return. And when he does return, he's going to come as both savior and judge. Be patient, James says, because, because he will have the final say. The prophecy that, that Jesus quoted from Isaiah chapter 61 has been fulfilled in Jesus and it will be completed when he comes again. So James writes and says, be patient. Remember when we talked about the science of waiting and all the studying and how that really what's key at the end of it is that what you waited for was worth it. James is writing to the church and he says, church, what you wait for, it's going to be worth it. James goes on then from there to help us understand this continue of faithfulness in the midst of suffering. And he says, remember that God is faithful. Remember that God is faithful. This is back in James 5. Again, at the very beginning, he says, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. So James uses this illustration of, of a farmer in order to help us to understand what, what waiting looks like, how we experience it. And, it. and it makes sense, and it would have made sense in that culture. They, they lived in an agriculturally uh, dominant world. That was their, their upbringing and their life, and so it would have been intuitive to them. And yet, this is more than just a, a farming illustration here. This, and, and I think this would have been apparent to those who, who are reading this letter for the first time. Especially those that, that grew up, who, who knew the Torah and knew the writings of, of the prophet. That, that phrase that James uses where he says, waiting for the autumn and spring rains in verse 7. That is a refrain that repeats multiple times throughout the Old Testament. And in every single instance that it's used in, in either the, the Pentateuch and, the, and, and Deuteronomy or in the writings of the prophets, it's used as an example of God's provision and God's faithfulness. See, this is more than an illustration that James is giving them. James is establishing their confidence in the whole story. Again, kids, you know when you're back there and Miss Libby or one of our other teachers is teaching, they talk about the big God story. This is exactly what James is talking about here. He's reminding the church of the big God story, of their fuller history, of all that has unfolded to bring them to this point. You know, you know like uh, if you've ever seen a commercial for investments, sometimes they'll have a phrase, a disclaimer that say past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. James is telling us exactly the opposite. He's saying past performance is absolutely indicative of future results. God was faithful in the past, and he will be faithful to you in the future. Like, I don't know if, if th this is what came to me when I was thinking about this this week, and, and if it doesn't work, um, I apologize. Uh, but you know, you know that I, when I was watching the Super Bowl last year, it was, it was the Philadelphia Eagles versus the Patriots. And I'm not, I'm not a Patriots fan just because they're too good. And I don't like Tom Brady that much. And, um, <laughs> and, and the Eagles scored a touchdown with about two minutes and 25 seconds left in the fourth quarter to go up 38 to 33. And I can completely remember in that moment, I said to myself, I know exactly how this ends. Tom Brady gets the ball back, the Patriots go down, he uses all two minutes and 25 seconds, they score a touchdown, they win the game, and, and well, what happens was the, the Eagles actually strip Tom Brady of the ball in their own area of the end zone, so they get it back, they're able to eat a little more time off the clock and kick a field goal. Now the score is 41 to 33, and the Patriots get the ball back with 95 seconds left on the clock, and I say to myself, I know exactly how this ends. <laughs> Tom Brady gets the ball, he marches down the field, he scores with no time left on the clock, they get the two-point conversion, they win in overtime. Like, I know exactly how this ends. And, and it almost did. Like, if you go back and look at that Hail Mary, it was close to, to unfolding the way. And the reason that I felt that way in that moment is because I'd seen it before. Because I'd seen Tom Brady and I'd seen the Patriots and Belichick. I'd seen them do this all before. In fact, they did it in the Super Bowl just the year before to the Atlanta Falcons. 
And this is, this is what James is evoking in us. He's saying, church, you've, you've seen it before. There was belief because we've seen it before. He's saying, remember, remember when the people of Israel were pinned against the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army is bearing down on them. Remember that God was faithful. Do you remember when the people of God were in the desert and they feared starving to death and they, they walked out in the morning to find the landscape covered in God's provision? He says, remember that God was faithful. Do you remember when you stood just on the verge of the promised land and the Jordan River, it was a rainy season, was swollen. And they took the Ark of the Covenant and they stepped in that water and it dried up. Do you remember when God was faithful? Do you remember the armies, the powerful armies that were defeated, the fortified cities where walls came crashing down? Do you remember that God delivered on his promise and his faithfulness? Do you remember when Jesus was in the grave? Three days. All hope was lost. Death certainly seemed victorious. And God was faithful. Past performance is it's indicative of future results. See, my, my tendency when I, I won't even call it suffering, when I'm in discomfort, my tendency is to feel like um, I'm owed something, that I'm, that I'm entitled to some sort of reprieve from continued obedience or from from faithfulness so that it's understandable or it's even maybe acceptable in, in the way I'm thinking to to be a little bit more selfish or to find some sort of escape and some destructive outlet to kind of numb that feeling in my life see James's call to remember that God is faithful is intended to empower our faithfulness in response because he has been faithful to us this is this incredible example of this in the Old Testament, a story of, of three young men who were held in captivity um, in the Babylonian Empire by a cruel but dominant king named Nebuchadnezzar. And he creates this statue of gold. You'll remember this story. And he says, every time the music plays, I want, I want everyone to bow down and worship this statue. And these three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, said, we're not doing that. We're not going to do that. We follow Yahweh. Yahweh is the one true only God. We're not going to bow down and worship some, some idols. So the music plays. And everyone is bowing. Like that's, that's an awkward moment, right? Like everyone is bowing and you're standing straight up. And they're called before Nebuchadnezzar and they're, they're sentenced to death. And Nebuchadnezzar even gives them another chance. He says, guys, hey, it's not too late. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be gracious here. I'm going to give you another chance. And this is their reply. This is from Daniel chapter 3. They say, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of, of gold that you have set up. Like that, that takes guts. And what empowers that response? A firm conviction that your God is faithful. I mean, these guys are living in captivity. Their, their immediate situation is not, has not been easy or comfortable for them. They're pulling on, drawing on something from their history that has proven time and time again that despite the, the circumstances they find themselves in, their God is faithful. Here's our confidence. Here is our assurance. God is faithful. And I, I, I've said this before, but I'll do this quickly. I want to encourage you once again, as an individual, as a family, find ways to remember and mark God's faithfulness. Because when you find yourself in a season of waiting, you will find that that reminder of his faithfulness gives you the ability to follow him in faithfulness to him. And lastly, then James writes to the church, and he says, stand firm. Look at, look at the beginning of verse 8 once again. He says, stand firm. You too be patient and stand firm. That, that phrase that James uses here, that literally translates, establish your heart. To act in confidence with obedience because I know of God's faithfulness. 
When we were in Ecuador years ago, one of our projects was to remove these massive tree stumps. And so we took students in, and this was all being done by hand primarily. We dug around the tree stumps and we cut all the roots that, that we could see. And so when we felt like maybe we were getting to a place where this thing might be getting loose, we called the tractor over and wrapped a chain around it and, and asked him to, to pull it out. And this was a big tractor and he, he pulls on the stump and it doesn't budge. And I thought to myself, that's not good. And, and, and what we discovered was that these stumps, this particular variety of tree, they would send a taproot deep into the ground, directly below the stump. And the only thing that that way that was coming out was for us to dig down deep enough to get to that taproot, cut through it, so that we could ultimately pull it out with the tractor. See, this is what James is, see, is sell, telling us as the church. He's saying, set deep roots, stand firm in your trust of God. And, and how do we do that? How do we grow in our capacity to do that? I was thinking about that this week, and... I think, it, I think it looks like this. I think it's asking ourselves the question, what does it look like to be faithful in this circumstance? And, and my encouragement is to do that in every season of life. Okay, God, this is where you've got me right now, and, this is, and things are going well, and, and I just got a raise at work, and I, what is it, okay, what is it going to look like for me to be faithful with this right now? Or maybe things are hard and, and there's difficulty. Maybe our family is, and is in a tough spot. God, what, is it, what does it look like for me to be faithful to you in this? See, the more that we ask ourselves the question and the more that we answer and respond in obedience to it, the deeper we set our roots. And my experience is, is that oftentimes the practice of that in our average, everyday, ordinary lives ultimately empowers us to stand when things are most difficult or when the waiting is the longest. Set deep roots, James writes. And then he gives us two quick examples of what this looks like. This is in, in the end of these verses here in verse 10 and 11. He says, brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. I, I, I love that James puts flesh to this. Because when you think about those two examples, think about Job for a second. Job lost everything. Jo, Job's family, his possessions, everything that he had was gone. And and Job, in the midst of all of that, he has his friends show up and say, well, this has got to be the result of some kind of hidden sin in your life, some unconfessed. This is, this is you've done something, Job. And Job grieves. Jo Job wants to defend himself in, in front of his God. He, he struggles and he questions, but he never abandons his faith. He, he clings to the fact, even in the midst of of incomprehensible circumstances in, in the God that he believes in. I think the story, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that the story of Job isn't sanitized to, to remove the honesty of the struggle. And then he cites the prophets. He says this, and this is important for us, because this isn't a promise that things are going to turn out the way we want to, we just, if we wait long enough. Matter of fact, some of the prophets that I referred to e earlier that referred to the spring and autumn rain, the, the provision and the faithfulness of God, some of those very prophets suffered intensely in their following of God. Some of them died, including our friend James. He would be one of the early martyrs of the church. You see, their realization of God's faithfulness wasn't found in the removal of their circumstances. It was found in eternity with him. But each and every one, as James has written, would not compare their sufferings with their salvation to the crown of life that, that has been promised to those who love him. See, the reason that James is teaching here on suffering and, and on, on life and commitment and honesty and following Jesus is so relevant to us is because we remain 
in that, t- that tension of the already and the not yet. That's the Christian life. And so life isn't always going to go perfectly because the kingdom of God is, is here and we have been invited into that. And yet he will not complete that. The kingdom of this world will not be defeated until he comes back. And so while we wait, there's going to be disappointment and pain and sometimes even suffering. And so James writes to the church and he says, be patient, church. Because the pain and the suffering aren't going to have the last word. Jesus is coming back and he's going to set things right. He says, remember that God is faithful. And let that confidence enable you to respond in faithfulness to him so that we can stand firm in who he is and what he's done for us. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for James' letter to the church. And God, we recognize that life doesn't always equal um, comfort or ease or or the way things go um, don't always look like what we plan them to be. And God, we know there's injustice and we know there's oppression and we know that there's uh, prejudice in our world. And Lord, we want to fight those things. As members of your kingdom, we want to push back on the kingdom of this world. But God, while we wait until your ultimate victory, until you return and you set things right, Lord, allow us to be patient in our belief that you are faithful. Enable us to stand firm. And we ask these things in